Hi dancers, welcome back to our deep dive into modern dance choreographers. So today we're talking about two. We're talking about Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean, and together they create their dance school and company, Dennis Sean. So we're gonna talk about Ruth first. Uh, Ruth was pretty much, um, well, she was similar to Isadora Duncan, who we talked about last week. Uh, they both grew up dancing, um, teaching dance, really into free movement. Um, they both had experiences in ballet and decided that that just wasn't for them. They didn't like, they both didn't like the ballet costuming, how it was rigid and corseted. Um, and they really appreciated the free movement that modern dance offered or what, what at the time was probably more considered abstract free movement. Uh, the only difference was Isadora Duncan never had really any formal training. She took ballet short for a short period of time um, when she landed in New York, but Ruth was a disciplined dancer. She had at least 10 years of classical theater training, singing, dancing. Uh, so she, she knew what she was doing. She was, she was classically trained. Uh, so Ruth was, um, teaching dance, performing, uh, doing free movement dance. Um, and it really didn't catch on. She didn't really have any kind of style until she saw a poster for, and this is kind of weird, an, an Egyptian cigarette company. And it had a picture of the Egyptian goddess Isis on it. And she was sitting serenely in a temple. And that, for whatever reason, triggered Ruth that this should be we should be looking at the, what she liked to call Oriental life, um, that was very exotic at the time We're we're talking Victorian or getting out of the Victorian era. So, uh, 19 teens, 1910, a little bit beyond that, uh, where the idea where we were finding all of these tombs in Egypt and it was, it was a very exotic way of life, something that we weren't used to seeing. And, very similar to Isadora Duncan and finding the uh, the Greek style that was interesting and exotic to her. This was for Ruth. This was earth breaking or earth shattering. Um, but this Oriental life idea that she had was one that combined worship of a spiritual god and one that combined the worship of the gods of art, as she liked to call it. Um, so it was. It was kind of a way of, of taking her spiritual beliefs as a Christian and her beliefs of art and the gods of dance and putting them together. So again, this dealt with um, not clothing women in the same way that our ballet dancers were. So we were letting go of that. But instead of, instead of using a lot of fabric, instead of clothing the dancers like Greek dancers or loosely fitted clothing, she was much more into partially clothing women. So, um, believe it or not, a bare waist or bare legs, which was very um, taboo in the day. You would not see women walking around like that. That just was not appropriate. Uh, but again, it was the idea that this is our body and we should be using it to move and not covering it. Uh, so a couple of the ways that she really um, inspired movement was, um, she had, so again, going back to this idea of oriental life, um, and I use the quotes because I don't really think that that's how we would think about it today, but it definitely was her, her theme and how she, uh, moved through this idea that she had and how it became kind of her niche in the world. Um, so she would choreograph dances where a woman would be partially clothed, meaning bare legs, bare waist, bare arms. Um, but she would be dancing with some burning incense and her body would mimic the movement of the smoke. Um, she would do a dance for a woman that would be dancing like a snake. So she, if she could find a snake, um, again, this was also at the time of vaudeville. So there would be people, um, if she was traveling the vaudeville circuit, there very well may be a snake charmer at a show. So if she could find someone with a snake and the snake could be on the stage at the same time, the woman dancing, the dancer could mimic the movement of the snake with her arms and then the hands would snap out like the snake bite. Um, so it was the body mimicking real life. 
Uh, she was popular in the States, uh, basically the New England area. Um, Boston had a really tough time finding her type of style appropriate. I'm not sure why Boston, but there's quite a few um, uh, instances in history that show that Boston just, they, they liked her, but they didn't like how she was dressing the women. It was, it was too, it was, it was just too shocking. Uh, but she then traveled to Europe and she was very successful in Europe. They really latched onto what she was, what she was throwing out. Uh, but she decided to come back to the States and I mean, like everything, you know, we, we do a dance recital every single year. Can you imagine how boring it would get if we did the same exact dances every single year? Now think about Ruth St. Dennis doing all of these dances over and over and over. It would get really boring. So she knew she needed to change up her act. And in 1914, she started auditioning for a male partner, just something, something different. And now we're going to switch over to Ted Sean, who's the other part of this dynamic duo. So Ted was completely different from Ruth. Um, he originally was studying for the Methodist ministry. He wanted to be a man of God and he did dance. He, but he used it as kind of a medicinal purpose. Um, he had an accident in college that left him partially paralyzed. And so he used dancing as an exercise to help build the strength in his, in his body. Um, now I don't know what his accident accident was. I don't know what the level of paralysis was. Um, I'm not sure on that piece, but that is what's been recorded. So we'll go with that. Um, he did train in ballet for a time being, but he primarily danced ballroom with women, um, in, in different circuits. So he, he was a dancer, but not anything like Ruth. Um, he actually saw Ruth perform a few years before they actually partnered together and he was smitten. He thought she was amazing as an artist and he thought she was amazing as a person. Um, when he saw that she was auditioning for a partner, he, he jumped at the chance and it just so happened that they hit it off. Um, not only did they hit it off, uh, as far in terms of their dancing, but romantically. And soon after they started partnering together, they got married and they then created their, their company and school, Dennis Sean. So they took Dennis and Sean, their last names and put them together to form Dennis Sean. Um, so with the company, um, they, they kind of, they worked together, but separately. So Ted really organized the company. He did the stretching classes, the ballet classes, um, free movement classes. And then Ruth really just did what Ruth does. She taught how she moves. She taught her, her theory and her idea behind the movement. Um, and, and that's kind of, I mean, they partnered together. They, they worked together on different pieces of choreography, but it really was, um, kind of Ted orchestrating everything and then Ruth getting to do Ruth's part. Um, I've got a book here. Um, this, I don't know if it's going to flip around to the right way or not, but it's called Dancing Through History and it's by Joan Cass. It's, it's a great book for anybody who's wanting to learn more about any part of dance history. Um, and I've been using this a lot to reference uh, what we've been talking about. Um, one thing I will say is that... Um, it's, it's been really interesting to go back. This was one of my college books and it's been interesting to go back. So I'm grabbing it. So I don't forget. I have a few quotes I want to read out of it later. Um, so as Dennis Sean is formed and they're teaching, they're starting to also take bits from other performers. So they had, um, they were inspired by Isadora Duncan, who was kind of at the same time. So they were kind of running on two tracks, um, parallel with one another. Uh, but they started incorporating some of what Isadora did. And they were also, there was something called Del Sarte, which is a pantomime um, method. And they were starting to incorporate that as well, which is kind of how they came up with their, their method, the Ruth St. Dennis method or the Dennis Sean method. Um, so the school was really popular up until about the mid 1920s. Um, but they had a uh, some really famous people in modern dance come through their school. And um, those would be Charles Whiteman, Martha Graham, 
Doris Humphrey and Jack Cole are just a, a few of them. Um, and if you think about the 1920s, we had a huge stock market crash, a recession, and we also had the Dust Bowl in the Midwest. So we had some really significant factors impacting our, ec our economy. And what happens when our economy goes down, money's a little bit more scarce, we don't we don't go out we don't um, spend money on things that we find a frivolous pastime so the arts was definitely one that was suffering from that um if anything it was vaudeville it wasn't your classical performances and unfortunately the the school and the company closed i think it was 1927 um and actually ruth and ted eventually divorced i think in 1930 and they parted ways um from there, uh, Ruth went on just continuing to be Ruth. Uh, she was egotistical, and, meaning she was very into herself. She was self-serving and she thought she was great and she knew she was great. Um, and, and she didn't hide that. She always said that she knew that she was. Um, and, and it's important, I think, to realize that she knew that she was paving the way for a lot of modern dancers and, um, and she was proud of it and rightly so. So I'm gonna read one quote um, because she just, she continued to perform. She continued to ch change up what she was doing. And there was one individual who saw her dance around um, age 90 and worded it this way. One went to see the elderly Miss Ruth perform out of respect for a legend, not expecting to be moved by her dancing. But surprisingly, even at that age, there were poignant movements and moments that provided glimpses of beauty and theatrical intensity. St. Dennis's dancing still evoked a sense of magnificent of the magnificent artist that she had been at the peak of her career. Although it was painful to see her totter and steadily, there was an admirable air of grace and dignity about her head and arm movements. Miss Ruth danced her own message, the belief in the development of the human being and in the body as the instrument of the individual spirit. Um, Ted went on and I feel like Ted gets even more important to the modern movement after Denishon. He went on to create an all-male dance troupe that successfully performed and toured for seven years. Uh, this was really to enhance men's uh, importance in modern dance. If you look at classical ballets, we all see how important the woman is. We rarely see how important the man is. So he really wanted to enhance the man's role in the dance world, especially modern. From there, he founded something called Jacob's Pillow. From there, Ted formed uh, Jacob's Pillow. And this was, um, first off, it, it's in Lee, Lee, Massachusetts. It still exists today. Um, and it started out as a an acreage, a farm, that Ted purchased in 1931. And that is where he converted a barn that still stands on the property today um, into a dance space. And that's where the male troop performed, or, or not performed, uh, they practiced until 1940 when that group ended. Um, and from there, Jacob's Pillow, he turned into um, a summer intensive and a concert series. So he would have still at this time, mostly men um, come out during the summer and he would teach ballet, that he would have ethnic uh, dance, modern dance, and they would put on a concert series. Um, and this is where I'm gonna jump in and read another piece. And this is about um, the school that, or the um, Jacob's Pillow. Um, it wasn't a school yet, but it was, more of the summer intensive part. Um, the art of dance is too big to be encompassed by any one system, school, or style. On the contrary, dance includes every way that man of all races in every period of time have moved rhythmically to express themselves. So he was really thinking more about in general, just how, and, and his focus was, again, the focus was on men because they weren't really seen as important in the dance world and he wanted to change that. Um, so if you would go to Jacob's Pillow today, men and women are equally involved, but then it was really trying to give men that springboard into the dance world. 
Um, but it was really important to realize that you can't just encompass all of our movement based off of modern or ethnic dance or ballet. It includes everything. All movement is important. Um, so Jacob's Pillow continued in that style um, up until, and, and Ted ran it up until his death in 1972. Um, and at that point, the name had kind of changed to the Jacob's Pillow University of Dance. Uh, so it's still working today. Um, it's, it's a summer workshop where dancers of every background can come together and learn dances of any background. And um, it includes things such as ballet, modern dance, ethnic dance, dance composition, anatomy, kinesiology, principle of movement and rhythm, mime, backgrounds of American dance, elements of performing, as well as stage workshop, and a series of lectures in dance appreciation. Uh, and this is something that I think typically in the summers, it's every Sunday, I think, where the, the uh, public can come out and watch performances. So um, that is what I have on Denishon. So two really amazing people from different backgrounds that came together for a part of their lives to influence how we see modern dance today. So next week, we will be talking about another really important dancer that uh, actually came from the Denishon School and Company. So uh, if you want to give that a little thought and see who it might be, and I will talk to you next time.